normally we would pay pre-pandemic, we would be paying about 4,000 US dollars to get a container to Toronto. Um, and now we just got a quote that is subject to revision of $20,000. This year we're gonna start off with this and then we're gonna go boom. It rarely happens and investors, they don't even like to see that. So they wanna see some realism, but they wanna see some optimism. Um, and they want to see that you've thought it through and that you're prepared for contingencies. Problems are what? Problems are profits! Welcome to another episode of the Problems are Profits podcast. My name is Rebecca Lynn Matheson, and I am joined by my co-host, Adam J.D. Martin, who has taken over today for Matt McKeever. And we are interviewing Patrick Harrison today, who is the founder of CoreChair. Uh, but before we get started with today's podcast, Adam, can you tell me a little bit about what Problems or Profits means to you? Yeah, Problems or Profits to me is really all about the mindset of seeking solutions. Um, so there's all sorts of things that come up in day to day business that uh, maybe discourage you from wanting to continue doing your business or maybe make you rethink all of your life choices um, or make you think, wow, how nice would it be to be back in bed today or just be on the couch watching some Netflix or something. And uh, problems or profits is really that mindset of just tackling these problems as they come up. Um, and hopefully you're doing that with some agility as well. And so problems or profits to me really is the mindset of taking what's happening in front of you and finding the solution in it. And more often than not, when you do that, you will discover that most problems have a hidden profit buried in them. And if you can just solve the problem, especially problems that other people aren't willing to solve, there's often a profitable solution under there. And that's uh, sort of how we got a lot of the businesses we have today, whether that's the real estate coaching with Cashflow Tribe, or uh, if we're talking about our wholesaling business, where we often solve problems daily with a lot of our sellers and solve the problem of deal flow with our buyers. So uh, that's what problems or profits means to me. Awesome. I definitely appreciate that. And we're going to get into it here. But before we get into the meat and potatoes of this podcast, I would love to start with a few warm up questions for you, Patrick. So uh, first question here is what is the most expensive thing that you've ever broken? <clears throat> That's a good question. I'm going to guess that it was my boat. <laughs> Your boat? What kind of boat was it? Uh, it was a great big boat, and uh, we live on a lake called Stony Lake, and it's very appropriately named. And there's probably more stones that are just under the surface than there are visible. So every once in a while, if you aren't following the charts, you might find yourself on one of those rocks. So Excellent. that was probably uh, an expensive little exercise. Did you get wet? Uh, no. Fortunately, stayed dry. Well, that's good. Um, but had the embarrassing... Uh, Toe, toe of shame. <laughs> yeah. Channel 16. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, that's never good. If you find yourself on channel 16, you are calling for help. And yep. uh, that's never a good sign when you're out on the water. Correct. Absolutely. Awesome. I definitely appreciate that. What is the... Um, actually, sorry, rather next question we are going to get into is if you had a million dollars and only 24 hours to spend it before it disappears. What exactly would you do with that million dollars? Whoa, you've got all the good questions. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, the prudent thing would be to make sure that you find something good to invest that in. Um, but the reality might be to pack up the bags and head on a whirlwind tour around the world, if we could do that. <laughs> I think a million dollars would probably buy your way into just about any country right now. Yeah, it's not a bad, uh, not a bad uh, budget to go with. Yeah. Where would be the first country that you would travel to? Um, well, I haven't been to uh, southern South America, so something like that would be nice. Argentina or Chile or uh, one of those places. Nice. That's awesome. Go on a nice little uh... new cultures and. Get some new experiences. Absolutely. Go on a little uh, Malbec tour in Argentina. Exactly. <laughs> Damn it. 
<laughs> Malbec it's is certainly wine. my favorite wine. <laughs> oh, we, I, there is a wine tour planned to Argentina at some point. So Perfect. it's just okay. a matter of who will be there. And then we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. Next question here for you to warm us up is why are you you? I didn't have a lot of other choice. So, but I would say that um, I personally grew up in a family of nine kids and uh, it's always a bit of a survival uh, instinct that gets uh, born out from that. So um, I think, uh, you know, probably a lot of it is uh, learning to uh, survive and learning how to deal with problems uh, to survive. And uh, yeah, just trying to find the path of uh, least resistance. It's not that easy to find all the time, but it's there. Absolutely. That's, that's awesome, Patrick. So why don't, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Like how, how did you grow up? What did some of the ventures you found yourself into? And then we can talk about what you're up to today. Okay, well, 10 years old, I started a newspaper route. I'm just kidding. So uh, I actually uh, went to university and studied kinesiology, which is a uh, kind of a, a scientific physical therapy. So a lot of biomechanics, physiology, uh, and, uh, and that type of thing. So when I graduated, um, nobody even knew what that word was. So a lot of times I would start my little pitch explaining what kinesiology was. Uh, now it's much more uh, accepted and integrated into the allied health professions. So um, what I found myself doing upon graduation was uh, I worked for the special education uh, department from the Board of Education in uh, Waterloo County. And uh, we, we started dealing with uh, children that had uh, physical disabilities that needed wheelchairs to, to get around. So we started designing uh, special seating systems for those kids. Uh, and then when that job ended and mo I moved to uh, British Columbia uh, for lifestyle and uh, got there and kind of told people that that's the kind of stuff I do, uh, all of a sudden I was inundated with people that wanted me to do that. So it was kind of a, a hurry up offense to try and uh, address the needs that were coming in pretty rapidly. And then uh, we went through a period of deinstitutionalization, which meant the people who had been bedridden for their whole life, now they wanted to get them up and get them into the community. So that was like my PhD in seating because it was dealing with a lot of people with severe fixed orthopedic deformities. So that business kind of evolved and uh, and we built that business up, became international distribution with it, and then eventually sold it to a, uh, a US-based company that um, has now taken it on to, to bigger things. So um, that's kind of the lead up to a, a period where I then got into different things like land development, alpaca farming, um, and everything that I kind of got into, as my wife would say, seem complicated. So uh, sometimes complicated is good. Often it's inevitable. And uh, so eventually ended up uh, creating core chair, recognizing the fact that people sit uh, far too much and uh, traditional ergonomic office chairs aren't always the best thing. Uh, the design uh, has not evolved very much. So we set out to integrate what I had learned from my wheelchair seating design days and integrated that into an active sitting office chair. Yeah, that's great. I mean, my back's currently hurting me right now on my uh, allegedly ergonomic chair. So um, on the topic of sitting, like what are some of the things that your product, like what are some of the benefits that your product is giving people? Cause I, I think a lot of people listening to this right now are probably in their car driving right? Or they're going to be home at their office watching this later or listening to this later from their computer desk. So why don't you just tell us a bit about your current product? And then I'd love to ask you uh, about some of your problems or challenges that you had to overcome in order to manufacture or design these products and, and how you brought it to business and what some of the plans are. So sure. first, what are some of these benefits? Well, I think probably uh, first and foremost, about 80% of the population has had at least one significant back issue in their lifetime. 
uh, and currently about 20% of the population is seeking some kind of uh, intervention. So physical therapy, uh, all the way up to possibly surgery. So um, sitting isn't always the culprit. Usually it's some of the other activities that we do or don't do uh, or don't do well. Um, and then if we end up sitting for prolonged periods of time, we just exacerbate it. So the core chair design is very similar to what we were doing with the wheelchair seating in that um, if you can picture in your mind someone that you know or you've seen uh, who is a paraplegic, which is paralyzed literally from the waist down, so they don't have function of their legs. Um, when they're sitting in their wheelchair, which they get into first thing in the morning when they get up until last thing at night when they go to bed, they don't have very much support at all. It's basically a seat in the back, low back. So it's, it's really to stabilize the pelvis. Um, when you picture somebody that is a quadriplegic, so picture Christopher Reeves, um, Superman, AKA, um, he became a quadriplegic, unfortunately. And if you can picture what he was sitting in, he was sitting in a full seating system with side supports, head and neck support, arm supports. And it was because he couldn't use his muscles. And if you picture now what we have accepted as an ergonomic office chair, it has a flat seat, it has a tall back, it sometimes has a head and neck support and it has armrests. So what we've done is we've actually taken people that could and should move and we put them into an environment where they don't move, they can't move. So there's very, very limited movement throughout the day and uh, the sedentary issues of not moving for prolonged periods of time is incredible, the way that it affects our, our physiology. So. The probably the two biggest things is um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the phrase sitting disease um, often referred to as sitting as the new smoking. Um, it's not really about sitting. It's about sitting and not moving. So the other problem is that when you get yourself seated properly and Adam, I see you shuffling around there now <laughs> uh, when you get yourself seated uh, properly. Um, what tends to happen over a period of time is you get this pelvic creep where your sit bones slide forward, your pelvis tilts backward, your spine goes into flexion, and you put an, an abnormal load on your intervertebral discs. And probably the majority of people that we talk to who have a pre-existing back problem, it's around L4-5, which is just at the top of the pelvis in your lumbar spine. And uh, the the easy fix to that is to pull the pelvis into a more vertical position and create more natural extension in the spine, more kind of an inward curve in the lumbar spine. And then the vertebrae stack up evenly as you go up the spine. So that's where this product is most effective is it puts someone into a good balanced, uh, optimal sitting posture and then it introduces movement. So the chair moves up to 14 degrees in all directions so that you've got good stimulation of blood flow from your lower extremities and you've got good stimulation of uh, blood and uh, cleansing of the lymphatic system and such um, for your physiology and uh, good muscle balance. So you actually, it's, it's kind of like sitting on an exercise ball. Uh, and if you've ever had a back issue when you go to a physiotherapist, that's one of the first things that they try to work on is to get your core strength uh, improved. So that's, this chair is, is kind of a therapeutic chair. That's awesome. I am 100% certain I'm suffering from exactly what you just talked about. Currently. I can feel yeah. it in my lower back right around that, uh, that exact spot that you just described. And it is because my pelvis is shifted forward and not vertical and I can feel the stress on my vertebrae. So um, I think all of this is actually important to talk about because we do a lot of us do a lot of sitting, right? So there's a lot of real estate investors that listen to this podcast. And I would say a lot of time is spent either driving for those people, or again, they're on the computer, likely consuming uh, educational products, or just even simply running the day to day operations, which might look like analyzing deals, looking for comparables on buildings, uh, scouring the market for potential opportunities. Um, 
you know, whatever you're doing, looking at an implementation plan, like all these things require you to be generally sitting unless you're using some sort of standing desk or something, which gets old after about 10 minutes anyways. So I find most people are sitting. Um, so I think this is actually an important discussion. And uh, I wasn't really sure uh, what your product was focused on today. So it's good to hear that it's on this because I know that this is a regular thing that bothers the hell out of me. And uh, I've gone to physio and stuff to to talk about it, but probably the better thing is to just have something that um, you can work on daily, which is just improving your posture and moving. So um, that's really cool. So what are some of the challenges that you faced when bringing this to market? I've never manufactured a product. We've almost always um, had businesses that looked more like a service business. So um, what are some of those hurdles that people can look forward to when they're starting a, a manufacturing or a, a product business? Yeah, probably the, uh, the the obvious thing is to make sure that there's a solid supply chain um, that um, that you can count on. And I remember, um, you know, I've got some other horror stories about my previous business experiences, which I've thankfully learned from. Um, but I remember along the path, I aligned myself with someone that was very experienced in the world of office chair design. And uh, they told me at one point in time, we had to decide whether we were going to create a product uh, that was top drawer quality, um, that was going to you know, be something that we would have less warranty issues and, and things like that. Or we had to decide whether we were going to be in the commodity business, the disposables. And uh, so obviously we elected to go with the quality thing because who wants to deal with uh, problems all the time. And uh, I think that's, that's a really key thing. Um, finding the suppliers uh, is really important. Um, we really tried hard to have a North American, 100% North American made product. And uh, unfortunately, it, it just wasn't possible for a number of reasons. One of which was um, we have a lot of uh, tools and molds and things like that. And so, so those tools and molds from the North American companies were made offshore. And uh, then all the logistics of getting them to North America and the companies standing behind them and all that type of thing, it just got horrific. Uh, so we ended up um, working with a Taiwanese company. Um, we have some of the components are made in North America and then we have to get them to uh, Taiwan. Uh, and right now, touch wood, everything is going nice and smooth. The product arrives. In fact, we have a container arriving today. And uh, so it shows up as a chair in a box. Uh, we do a quality control inspection when it arrives, but 99% of the time, they've already done a good job at, uh, at origin. So, so that works smooth. But we've been working at this now for uh, just about five years. So um, it, there's been some challenges along that path. The biggest challenge that we have right now, uh, which is a problem that we're looking to find a profit on, <laughs> is um, there's a real big shortage of freighter ships and containers. So yeah. normally we would pay, pre-pandemic, we would be paying about 4,000 US dollars to get a container to Toronto, um, and now we just got a quote that is subject to revision of twenty thousand dollars to get Whoa. that same container. So there's a, a, a shortage, as I said, of, of um, the transportation factors, uh, but also uh, there's a lot of companies who are kind of panicking. Um, <clears throat> the bigger companies are already stocking up for Christmas. Yeah, hard to imagine because it's like 30 degrees outside, but uh, but they need to get the supplies in in the uh, funnel, so to speak. So um, a lot of that has put a lot of added pressure. So um, we've tried desperately um, and we've been successful so far uh, to not affect our retail price, which obviously means that we have to affect our, our margin. Yeah. Uh, so you know, those are just the things that you have to kind of react to. So you start off with a good plan because you have to have that. And then you make sure you've got your supply chains all sorted out, your communications to your customers. 
Um, and then you just almost be ready <laughs> for what might come at you. And uh, cause you can't pre-think all of that. So. Yeah, that's a really interesting um, thing to bring up. I think there's a lot to be said there about how we've changed our manufacturing since kind of the industrial revolution to go into largely just-in-time manufacturing, right? And, and just-in-time inventory systems where we, a, a lot of companies barely hold any inventory in anything, right? We're, we're generally speaking, relying heavily on these supply chains. And I think the reality that you brought up there is just, it's probably always going to be true that we do not have a comparative or a competitive advantage in manufacturing in North America in almost anything. Right. It, it will always make more sense to use a global economy to produce something like a chair. Right. That it, it's just that's just the reality, I think. And um, it'll be very interesting to see what happens with the supply chain and particularly uh, what happens in Taiwan. Right. I think <clears throat> if we're thinking pretty globally here, uh, China and the Chinese Communist Party have some really interesting thoughts about Taiwan, and that makes mm -hmm. it. Uh, a very, I would say, likely to be disrupted market, which is uh, kind of scary for manufacturing. And um, I, I guess what that really is, is us maybe contemplating what the profits are, or what the problems are, and if there's a better way to solve it. Like, I know a lot of people were looking in Mexico for manufacturing, or they were looking in um, India or Pakistan, or even just China, really. But it's really interesting to contemplate these things. Are there some best practices that you identified for um, identifying what a good supplier would look like? Because I, I think that's a really interesting thing. Like if I just, if I imagine right now, I wanted to compete with you, maybe I would steal your design and sort of work off what you've already got. But then I would have to go out to this giant world, literally a whole world mm -hmm. of suppliers and I, I don't know. Are Google reviews going to get me there? I don't think so, right? So how do we how do we select a, a better supplier or a better strategic partner? Well, I think there's a there's a lot of tools that are coming to play now, which uh, are helpful. Um, <clears throat> there has been a lot of challenges with companies going to China to manufacture. Um, some refer to it as the Wild West. Uh, it's kind of like buyer beware. If you're going for you know, something like a, a low cost Frisbee that you want to have made in huge volumes, it's probably not that bad. Uh, if you're going with a more technically advanced product such as ours, uh, you really do have to be careful. Um, there are companies uh, that will do quality assurance uh, on the ground at the source. Um, my uh, preference and, and it, I, I think it's has been proven to be very effective is I've since we've started I've probably done five or six trips to Taiwan so it, it serves a number of good purposes one is you develop a good relationship with your partners and make sure that that they understand that it's all about quality um, and the, the word of mouth in terms of who's had good experiences with a certain company is it, I mean, that's global. So it's the same here in North America as anywhere else in the world. Um, so to have somebody recommend somebody with some good experiences with them re is really helpful. Um, but certainly to have that relationship and to make sure that everybody understands what the SOP and the SIP are, uh, what our bar is in terms of quality and to have somebody that will stand behind what they've made. So we've been very, very fortunate that we have a very good supplier uh, in Taiwan. Um, geopolitical concerns always uh, hang out there, even between Canada and the US. Sure. Um, so there, I mean, that's probably a good reason to do domestic uh, manufacturing, uh, but then it really comes down to what your product is and what the market is prepared to pay for it. So right. if you are making something that's really good, uh, but your cost to make it is so high that you have to price it too high, then people say that's too expensive. Uh, and we did have that experience. Our first chair is the classic chair. We've had like six different university studies done on it. Um, it's, it's proven to be quite effective. 
Um, but we had a lot of people saying, we really like this design, but it costs too much. In Canada, it's $995 retail, but it has a 12 year warranty. So we've tested it far beyond what the industry standards are. And so we're comfortable putting that warranty on it. Um, but we had to react to the market. We had to uh, make sure that we had a product that would work similarly, but be less expensive. So then we came up with the Tango, which is the same uh, human interface as the classic, but it has just one constant movement in it. So it doesn't have an adjustable resistance. And we had to skinny back on some of the uh, quality components on it to, uh, to kind of get our costs down. So yeah. and that's proven to be quite effective. It's, it's, um, it actually boosted our classic sales because a lot of people would say, okay, I'm going to invest in this chair and, oh, you've got, you've got one that's, uh, that's even better. Maybe that's the one that I need to have. You know, I've got mm -hmm. my, yeah. my audience back here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. They're, yes. they're saying go for the premium. That's yeah, saying. <laughs> 100%. That that kind of brings me to my next question for you, Patrick, is, is taking a product, once you've got one, once you've got the concept, once you've got the manufacturing set up, how do you set up your systems for marketing and investment as you continue to progress? And what are some of the challenges that you experience? I know from your company's perspective, you were kind of on the ground running with doing different TV interviews, doing different TV shows, even uh, for investing and and beyond, uh, just what are some of the challenges that you faced during that time or experiences that you went through? Well, I'll tell you the fundamental change is you may not have noticed because this isn't platinum blonde. <laughs> well, I've been around for a bit. And uh, my first business, the, the wheelchair seating design company, um, we did really well with that. We, we fit into that marketplace perfectly. We were the market leaders. And uh, generally, that was a really good success story. Then I took some time. I was actually going to retire after I sold that company, but I couldn't do it. Um, and then I became an alpaca farmer. So we couldn't do just a two or three animals. We had like 120 uh, with a whole farm operations and seminars and things like that. So it was really successful. And then I got into some land development. And I tell you that to say that when I decided to start Core Chair, I was maybe flirting with a little bit of arrogance in that I had had some success in the past and this is going to be a no brainer. We'll just roll this out, same kind of game plan, brush off the old business plan to get things rolling. In that interim, everything changed so much this technology in particular where you could have these educational forums being in a large group um, where you could do digital marketing whereas before it was all print advertising uh, and trade shows and and uh, kind of meet and greets and uh, out on the road and things like that it's it's all changed so much so for me that was a huge wake-up call that I had no idea how to get set up in this current uh, state of affairs. So um, that took a lot of, and I would say it's still evolving because it seems like once you get it figured out, everything's changing so rapidly that you're already behind by the time you figure it out. So I have to surround myself with people that can add that value. So I know what we want to achieve then I need to align myself with smarter people that can figure out how to get that message out and how to um, kind of build on that and stay one step ahead as things change. So it has been, um, as I say, that's probably the biggest challenge in getting this whole, this business going. So, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's working out quite well. So it's um, really, being patient, uh, perseverant, and um, and being open to new ideas, uh, as opposed to being kind of hard in what your game plan is and how you did things before, it's ever evolving. So that's that's probably my biggest two cents on that one. 
Yeah, it's awesome. Agility is one of the core values at our company, and that really encompasses that idea of, you know, if, if there's a collision in front of you, it, it's not usually best to try an emergency break because you've probably seen the collision last second. That's why it's a surprise, right? And uh, the best option is usually break a little bit and then pivot and avoid that thing, right? You got to get out of the way of that accident. So, um, yeah, that, that's really interesting. How are you distributing these products? Like, is this currently just North America? Or are you are you attacking global demand? Yeah. So currently, we do the um, marketing and physical distribution in North America, so Canada and the U.S. Uh, we have a distributor uh, based in Germany for Europe. Um, cool. And they are an office chair manufacturer as well. So we're just a nice complement to their current offerings. Uh, we've got a, a distributor in South Korea and uh, we're just setting somebody up in India right now. And we've got uh, a partner in China, which we're still trying to navigate our way through that. But uh, for the most part, our focus is North America and Europe. Um, Europe is a little bit more hands off, very competent partner. Uh, in North America, pre-pandemic, uh, we were an entire sales force. Um, we had uh, dealers throughout North America, which with the pandemic, a lot of them had to shut down, skinny down. Yeah. Um, and then now, uh, I guess we're not quite post-pandemic, but we're moving our way through, fortunately. Um, but now probably 90% of our sales are all direct to consumer. So That's awesome. we sell online, we offer a 60 day satisfaction guarantee on our product, which our returns are about two to 3%. So they're, they're quite low for online sales. And, um, yeah. And then we sell through Amazon and, uh, companies like office Depot and Staples and things like that. So that's fantastic. No, that's amazing. What sort of um, like what sort of marginal hits do you take when you use a service like Amazon? Like, are they taking a decent cut to provide your product on there? Yeah, the Amazon's interesting because they're really outwardly focused to the customers. Yeah, and not. I wouldn't say that they're uh, hard on their suppliers, but they are. Um, we we send inventory to them yeah and then as they get the order so that they've got their 24 hour delivery uh then then they ship it out and uh the biggest challenge is that we don't have contact same with office depot and staples and, and those dealers we don't have contact with the end user right so a lot of times with our direct business if somebody's having an issue with a chair usually they just haven't set it up properly or they've got some some uh, differences from the norm that that needs a little bit of tweaking uh, then we get a chance to talk to them because they call us and they may call us and say I want to return this chair because it feels terrible and then we can talk to them and take them through a, a basically we do a virtual ergonomic assessment um, and then there's a lot of extra little adjustments that can be done in the chair uh, that aren't so obvious so then we can take them through that and uh, so, so that makes our success rate that much better. And we feel so much better that we're actually, you know, to, to end a conversation with somebody saying, oh, wow, this is amazing. This, this actually does as much and more than I was expecting because now I have it set up properly. That's awesome. With the dealer network, we're once removed. So right. uh, sometimes we can uh, interfere with the traditional dealers, uh, but with Amazon, we don't, we don't have an ability to, to reach the customer. And mm. so, you know what I just said. So we can we can do some tweaks. So that's that's the only drawback. The upside is that Amazon has a much more established brand than we do. Yeah. So people they may even see our ads or find out about us, um, but because of their uh, relationship with Amazon, they would prefer to purchase through Amazon. So it works for us. Um, usually we're about. Um, when you add in all of those extra costs, we're about 30 to 34% um, that Amazon takes on the wow. sale. Oh, wow. Wow, I guess that's how you build a, 
a company going to space. Um, <laughs> uh, Jesus, that's a lot. That's a big take. But um, one interesting thought I just had as you were speaking there, Patrick, is one thing that a lot of North Americans have been doing for the last year and a while is that anytime we've been having dining experiences, I found that a lot of people are actually now using virtual menus, right? You've mm -hmm. been to a restaurant lately and, and used a QR code. Right. I wonder if you couldn't just simply add to your package some sort of sheet with a QR code that would take them to something like a YouTube channel where you might actually just have pre-recorded videos on some of these adjustments and the common FAQ. Um, I find a lot less people now are reading owner's manuals and reading uh, that type, like reading, let's just say reading. I think a lot yeah. less people are reading. Yeah. Um, and so I think people have really done well one technology that's really just surged lately has been these qr codes and you can mm -hmm. use them to go anywhere to like a, a visual stimulus or you could use it to go to an audio visual stimulus like a video and uh, that's something i'm seeing a lot more of and it might just help that that one little problem there but um that's interesting yeah adam it's actually interesting that you say that because sometimes you have to trust your instincts yeah and as we were bringing the product to market i I was just kind of getting my head wrapped around the QR code thing. Yeah. We were working with a marketing company at the time and the principal of the company said, QR codes are a thing of the past. Yeah. They're, they're, we've been through them. We've done them. They don't work. Yada, yada. And um, I was persevering on it. So nice. Uh, we do have QR codes. Uh, in fact, uh, on the chair underneath the seat cushion, there's a QR code. Cool. So it'll take somebody when they scan, it'll take them right to our site uh, with all the instructions, how to build it, how to fit it, exercises that you can do on it. Um, and then we, we don't, we used to do uh, a book to your point uh, in four languages and it was, you know, pretty pictures. And whenever we had returns, I noticed those books looked like brand new. <laughs> yeah, they've never been opened. Yeah. <laughs> So now we actually put a postcard in there and the postcard yeah. has the QR code and has the URL. Yeah. Uh, and with Amazon, uh, we now to try and find a workaround. Uh, and so we don't have a problem with our direct to consumers for the most yeah. part. Um, but with Amazon, because we're once removed, we've done two things. So one is we put a flyer in with the chair. So when they open it up, there's a flyer sitting there that says, uh, something like do you need some more help or something like that and it has the all the information on how to contact us and then we've also been able to when somebody orders a chair through Amazon then we can um, uh, we have an automated email that goes out to people that have agreed to accept that awesome basically has the same information yeah so it's you're, you're bang on it's how do you stay in touch with the customer how do you engage them how do you get them to want to really understand uh what what it is they just bought why yeah. they bought it, and how to make it work best for them so that's kind of our our current head that is, is we want success we want people to enjoy the product for sure yeah. yeah a great customer is usually going to be a returning one or at least get you some referrals as well to be a, a promoter right you want to be exactly. promoted um that's really that's interesting right. and i think that paired with even just some basic educational products like even your quick talk there on the lumbar and like how you're probably sitting right now is such right. an it's such a great thing to bring up because yeah like as you're talking about it i'm like god damn it all i can feel is my lower back and now that i'm focusing on it it's even worse and my posture is terrible and this chair sucks and like i'm having all these thoughts as you're saying it and i just bet everybody listening to this podcast but also everybody listening to your informational product would have the same idea right they're like damn it <laughs> we need to fix this right now um last question about amazon right. then i promise i'll leave it alone um, when you send your inventory to amazon or any of these third-party distributors are you are you covering those inventory costs like are those holding costs for you and then they distribute it and you sort of get paid some sort of monthly allocation or something, or are they purchasing that inventory? No, no. So as, as the supplier, yeah. we send the inventory to Amazon on our nickel. Right. And it sits in their warehouse. They limit how much inventory you can put in. So sometimes that gets a little precarious because if the volumes are moving quickly, yeah, 
then it means that we need to keep sending bulk shipments to yeah. get to Amazon. Uh, in the US, uh, we end up sending to various Amazon warehouse locations. Um, so what we're trying to do is have them sent to one location, let them uh, dispense the warehouse. Uh, but yes, so we send it to them. Uh, they keep it in inventory. When they get an order for it, they send it out on their nickel to the customer. And then uh, they let us know about the order and then they we invoice them and they uh, they pay us. And it's usually monthly. And right. they're pretty good uh, on the payments. Um, there's not a lot of not a hassles. I mean, I, I think Amazon is a really good example of a business model that has has figured a lot of these things out. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. that, that's fascinating. But I mean, as a, as a business owner, man, if they're sitting on inventory and you're sitting on inventory and Staples is sitting on inventory and and so on and so on, that is uh, interesting to me, right? I mean, that that's a expensive business model. So um, I guess a, an interesting question that just naturally arises for me is like, how does one go about getting the startup capital or the operating capital to do that? Because obviously, when you hear inventory, you have to think capital. Um, was that from previous ventures? Or did you go about raising capital for this business? Yeah, so we actually uh, <clears throat> did have the success in the previous business. So that offered some some good cash available for that type of thing. Um, second to that, for core chair, we actually um, reached out and, and got some investors. So we do have some stakeholders in Corporate And um, so that kind of takes a little bit of the burden off. Um, the challenge with having shareholders is, uh, and we've been fortunate in that regard, but uh, the biggest challenge is that uh, a lot of people, they, they invest and they assume that you're going to have this Amazon outcome and uh, and then they're going to get their money back plus 100 times that. Uh, so for anybody who's getting started in business, uh, you know, there's always been these formulas that have been tossed about loosely about restaurants taking seven to 10 years and manufacturing taking five to seven years. And, you know, there's all these uh, things that it, I think it's good that people um, kind of tune into that because to your point right at the very beginning, um, it's when people get impatient and uh, feel like this isn't what I plan to do. I didn't, I didn't mean to work 24 um, seven and give up all my other life hobbies and such. Uh, so I think they need to know it's gonna take some time. So they need to make sure that they've got some uh, backup, some, uh, grandma that's got some extra cash that she's willing to risk on your behalf. Uh, so I, it's really important that people realize that the instant success stories are few and far between. The mo for the most part, and you guys are experiencing it with all your different ventures. Nothing rarely goes to plan. Um, the old hawk mm -hmm. thing, we're gonna, this year we're gonna start off with this and then we're gonna go boom. It rarely happens and investors, they don't even like to see that. So they want to see some realism, but they want to see some optimism. Um, and they want to see that you've thought it through and that you're prepared for contingencies. And nobody wants to deal with somebody that's going to be scratching the bottom constantly just to stay open. So it's, it's valuable to have some good cash resources for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Your particular partners, did, were they, did they happen to be industry experts or were they totally unrelated or uh, did you reach out to some sort of venture capitalist firm? Like how did you go about identifying these partners? Yeah, so the biggest challenge with a startup is yep. um, nobody wants to see the hockey stick and if they don't know anything about it, they're also very leery about getting involved. Um, and what that causes is a lot of startups to actually go to their circle and find people that are, you know, looking for a little bit of kind of risk reward type investments. Um, and it's difficult to get uh, anybody who's going to drop in 
a lot of money. And the problem with getting somebody that does drop in a lot of money, then you pretty much liquidate your uh, value in the company. So if you want to maintain uh, your equity hold in the company, then it sometimes is worth considering having smaller, uh, larger group of, of investors that, um, that have a good net worth and are willing to take a risk. Yeah. So, right. Right. There's a yeah, tremendous means- book on this called Venture Deals. If anybody's interested in uh, raising capital or identifying potential partners or, or even talking to real venture capitalist firms like this, this book Venture Deals really breaks out several different strategies for that type of raising and, and some of the different things to look out for. Because as Patrick just mentioned, it uh, it's not always advantageous to get a huge investor that's dropping a ton of capital on you because the type of person that has that level of capital also is very educated in how to acquire uh, interest in your company. So you have to be very aware of that type of thing. So that's an interesting point to bring up. Sorry, Rebecca, I think you had something there. And if you're not, yeah. a, if you're not a good driver, once you've got that money behind you, then they put a lot of squeeze on you mm-hmm. um, and then if you're not performing the way that you said you were going to, then you're going to need more cash. Next thing you know, they, they already bought your company. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Patrick, for the young entrepreneur who maybe doesn't have that circle or capital coming from previous ventures, you are clearly a serial entrepreneur that have, you've done everything even up to an alpaca farm. So um, for that young entrepreneur that's coming up and maybe doesn't have grandma's money or doesn't have that circle close to them with, um, capital to invest in in their company uh some of some of those entrepreneurs will be drawn to different pathways and tv shows and and flashy things and um i know you actually had some experiences with dragon's den and a few of those other um more flashy ways of raising capital or um, presenting your products so i'd love to hear a little bit about your experience in just pursuing um pursuing active capital in your in your business yeah so i think um one of the things that i learned right in the beginning was what is now becoming or is pretty established is crowdsource uh funding and um the very first time we did it we did uh india go indie india go go whatever it's called and uh it's we weren't quite prepared for that and um we ended up i I can't remember what the details were but it 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 just didn't uh didn't launch well and uh failure to launch i guess that's the one um so then we did a kickstarter and kickstarter was awesome and the nice thing with uh kickstarter and and probably indiegogo had we had it all dialed in uh is that you basically do pre-sales so you have an opportunity Mm -hmm kind of get your pitch established and convince people that this is something worth uh, purchasing in advance. So uh, that gave us a lot of confidence that the product had some merit, had some potential, and and it it provided us, we didn't really make a lot of money on that. It was more of a test on it, but it did bring in the revenue that that got us started and allowed us to, to, as soon as our product came in, we were able to send it out. Um, Dragon's Den was an interesting, uh, uh, experience for us because, um, we, uh, applied to get on the show and I think as we were analyzing who the dragons were, we realized that there wasn't really anybody there that fit our category. I mean, it's an office chair, (laughs) so it's, it's hard to get to make an office chair based on what we've been talking about what everybody relates to as an officer, it's not really sexy. So uh, it's tricky to, to make it that way. And when we looked at the dragons that were there, we realized the chance of us getting a deal is not very good. And what we really then made it our focus is how to get it televised. And mm. that was our main objective. Uh, we started working through a deal during the show um but we we literally got caught up in the office chair discussions um with dragons but 
as an outcome, we had national exposure. Uh, our yep. sales just took off. Like uh, that's from awesome. The, from the date of airing, it was uh, a very good success. So, I would I would encourage anybody to uh, to take their ideas that channel. Just make sure you know your stuff really well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a great a great place to practice too. And one thing I think we can all say for sure is more people, not less people, are going to be sitting in the future. It's it's just the way it's yes. going with with uh, Zoom happening. Right, everybody's working at home. You're not working at your office provided uh, chair or whatever that looks like. A lot of people are just going to work from home now. And I think telecommunications and stuff has made this possible. And um, I, I think it's actually a really brilliant thing. Like, cause if there's obvious global demand for this, more and more people are going to be sitting. The internet's becoming even more cool. Computers are becoming faster and cheaper and easier and more accessible to the rest of the world. And, uh, and I'm sure that's not the only reason why we sit, but that's a big part of sitting right daily. Um, so that's really cool, Patrick. Well, thanks again for explaining so much today about sort of some of the different challenges and things with manufacturing a product and bringing that to market. I think that's a really cool thing that we've not really talked about much on this podcast yet because really? almost everybody we know is more into like just real estate in general, which kind of almost looks like a service, right? Like you technically have a product at the end of the day, but it's it really is just a service of, uh, you know, turning the property around or whatever conducting renovations and then marketing it. So definitely an interesting discussion. And I am going to go buy myself a goddamn core chair because my back hurts every day and I hate it. So uh, I will be ordering one. So I assume your website's the most profitable way for you. So I'll just find that right now. Yeah, the website uh, for us is good. Um, obviously, we end up with a little bit more margin than selling through a dealer. Um, but also I think the, the big thing is the value add that, that we can provide as far as interacting. And, you know, the, I just to add that the, the pandemic, uh, which has been a terrible experience for us socially, um, uh, and economically, but, um, for the fact that people are working from home has been incredible, but, uh, we talked to so many people that have been working from home, sitting at their dining room chair at their dining room table and trying to yeah. run their their daily productivity and back pain is just rampant right now so for us it's been really good um for our business challenge has been keeping inventory um so i i think uh it's a, it's a good investment for people to make sure that they've got something that's that's working for them so that they don't have to suffer through back pain as they're trying to be productive throughout their day. Yeah, I Absolutely. love it. I love framing it like an investment, right? I've got one of the, you know, better computers on the market. I've got the best, you know, everything that I use daily, I've got the best of. And then I've got this bitch ass computer chair that hurts me every day. So I don't know why I would do that. So you heard it here first, people. Inventory is eventually going to slow down. So go buy one right now. Because uh, I know I am. My only decision is should I buy a classic or a sport? Because both these look freaking sweet. So usually what I tell people is if you're active and you don't have any kind of pre-existing back problem, then the tango is awesome. If you have a pre-existing back issue, which Adam, I'd kind of take you into that category a little bit, um, it has adjustable resistance. So it means that you can control how much movement you've got through the day. So it's, it's, probably better you can kind of tune it down so you're not kind of rocking and rolling like i am right now um but you know if you're doing podcasts a lot and you're doing zoom meetings and things like that sometimes people get distracted when somebody's moving around too much yeah. so, um so the classic is uh it's it has a 12-year warranty the tango is a three-year warranty so it's a little bit better investment uh, all around i love oh, that I'm well <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for, for joining us today on the Problems or Profits podcast. Now, before we end today's podcast, where can people find you or the core chair? Good. I thought you were going to say this, just some rapid fire questions. <laughs> <laughs> I already told you we wouldn't do that to yeah, you. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, so our website is uh, corechair.com. And uh, there's a lot of information on there. So there's information on the 
testing that we've done, the university studies that have happened. Um, and uh, there's some good information in terms of differentiating. Uh, to your point, Adam, uh, we did a video because we, uh, we, we continue to learn. Um, and so we had so many people since we introduced the tango saying, what's the difference between the tango and the classic? So we have a video that explains the difference between the two chairs. So um, I would say our returns are really low uh, because most of our customers really do a lot of research. And uh, I, I can't, couldn't tell you what the average time is that people have on our site, but it's pretty high. So they're going through making sure that they're making the right decision and uh, so they're a more informed customer and that's that's great for everybody especially the customer absolutely well patrick thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of the proms or profits podcast and uh, i i'm sure everyone gained a lot from just hearing about your background in the industry and experience in building and growing multiple businesses so uh, thank you so much for coming on today to talk a little bit about the product and how you've been able to accelerate with that product in your business so patrick thanks again for coming on my pleasure Hi. thank you for what you're doing i think this is an awesome service that you provide yeah for sure it's always just so good to talk to other business owners and just get their insights and hear about their challenges and ways that they've overcome them as well so i uh i just hit confirm i'm the proud owner of a classic core chair so that's sweet i hope it arrives expediently and uh, we'll, uh, I'll drop some comments when this is live as to whether or not it's as freaking cool as it sounds. Thank you. Your order has been received. I love it. That was super easy too. And I created an account and didn't have to make some shitty password with like a hundred different types of characters and something I'll never remember. So I appreciate that as well about your website, Pat. That was simple. I just ordered it within one minute and uh, yeah, I'm very excited to not have my back feel the way that it currently feels. So Perfect. it's awesome. It looks like you build through Stripe, which is the easiest and best way to do online. So that's super cool. Yeah, Look at awesome. that. I know developing the website is, uh, you guys would know this more than me because it's not my bailiwick, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's really precarious because things are changing so much and you need so many plugins and yeah, everything. So it's, it's really good to have a good team behind to, to make all this happen. Yeah. There's nothing worse than a bad website these days. Yeah. Like it there, and there's no excuse for it either, even though people like us, cause I'm in the same boat as you, Patrick, uh, we find it sometimes challenging, but honestly just pay somebody, they'll make it great for you. And uh, Pat's website worked out really well just now. So awesome. awesome. Guys. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming on and stay tuned for Adam's review of the core chair. All right.